So, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about like uh, you know China's specific, specific interest in like you know military, economic uh, technology that they're stealing. But how does this relate to like space exploration? Because that seems to be, you know, that's that's a new field. That's not something where there's like established cheap knockoffs you can make. You can't make the you know the cheap knockoff rocket to the moon. Right. What China recognizes <clears throat> and understands is um, <clears throat> that the U.S., particularly U.S. military and such, is highly dependent on space. So, you know, their advances in things, what we call counter space, is an ability to stop the U.S. before there's ever a military issue or a problem, right? If you can poke out the eyes and ears of the United States and they can't control forces, then, then there is no issue. The U.S. doesn't have an ability to, to, to threaten you. So from China's perspective, dominance of space, and to be frank for all nations, you know, all world powers, right? Dominance of space is a huge thing. China has a, uh, what we call a space information corridor under the Belt and Road Initiative, where they offer up space services for countries at very, very inexpensive rates. And the result of which is that they're able to ship all that information back to Beijing. So they actually, over parts of the world, claim information dominance, right? So it doesn't matter if you're in the U.S. embassy talking someplace or if you're on the ground controlling a drone in, in a foreign country or something like that. It's all going through China's space network. If you're one of those countries that's under the Belt and Road Initiative using their space information corridor. So uh, China has democratized space uh, in a way to control information and to have information dominance. Now, for a warfighter or even for, um, for economic reasons, that's an extraordinary ability to have, you know, where you can control, divert, slow down uh, uh, data, you know, move it forward. You, you know what people are thinking before it happens. You know, simply because you control the information flow, which was why 5G was such a big deal. Uh, they've actually communized space, I think. Yeah. So, okay. So basically the CCP looks at space. Like, we're, like I still think of space as like rocket ships, um, mainly because when I was a kid and played with Legos, which I definitely don't do as an adult, uh, I always wanted to build rocket ships, right? And so I think of space as like, people cruising around in space and having space battles. But really, like when you're talking about space dominance, you're talking about something else, right? Right. Space is all about information. That's what space is for, for, for nations, for militaries, et cetera. It's all about information. It's about moving information and protecting information and getting it from place to place. Whether you're doing remote sensing and you're taking pictures or spectrally imaging another country or facility or something like that, or whether you're moving communications around the globe. It's all about information. And that's in China, and they've said it in doctrine, that's what they seek to dominate, you know, have information dominance in space. Now, in order to do that, you have to be able to protect your assets as well, right? So there's that component to it. But the end goal is information dominance, you know, as they say, in, through, and to space. A kind of Skynet, if you will. Yeah. Exactly. Good way to think about it. Uh, so, because what what they want to do in space is kind of like um, what's what's Elon Musk's company that has SpaceX. The, SpaceX. No, but at, not SpaceX, but like the sa the satellite link thing, where oh, you have um, um, Starlink. No, Starlink. Starlink. Yeah. So you can be now anywhere in the world and connect to the internet through Starlink, right? Right. And what is the CCP doing with respect to that concept? Uh, well, Elon Musk, in a way you could say shellacked him uh, because he came out with Starlink and he pushed forward a, um, a concept of using these satellites in Le what we call LEO, low Earth orbit, right? Uh, very easy to put up. You can put up 50, 60 at a time. Uh, and because the technology is so developed now, uh, these things can do phenomenal things. Great on Leon. So what he does is he opens up an entire world, middle of Africa, Latin America, all the emerging nations, China, Asia. He opens up to being able to get communications, being able to do phenomenal things in moving data around, but they were never opened up before. 
right? So this is what happens with um, Starlink and any number of other commercial small sat space companies. China is actually behind on this. They're, they're, they're way behind and they're trying desperately now to catch up because this is sort of the control of space that can go and look at the difference it's made in the Ukraine war. Musk gives out thousands of terminals and, you know, the Russians are getting pounded because of it. They tried jamming it and they're unsuccessful at it. So this is where the future of space is going, where the future of space security is going. And, and China's still not a player on this. And I guess I could see a scenario if Musk were to not care about his Chinese investments, where if there was another, you know, nationwide mass protest movement in China, the Chinese government tries to nix the Internet. Musk could put Starlink in that area and then people have access to the Internet. Right. And that, that worries governments all over. Surely not the U.S. government, who is completely benevolent and has no ill intentions. Yeah. Anything out of any government's control is always a worry. So with the CCP doing all this espionage, you know, I know a lot of it's in the U.S. and, you know, most of that is in Silicon Valley. But what about Taiwan? So out of the bona fide espionage cases I have, which are probably, I don't know, 120 espionage, espionage cases. Like James Bond kind of stuff? Like like uh, like military, you know, um, plans, intentions, political information, things like that. Um, out of those, fully worldwide, fully half of them are Taiwan. Wow, that's a huge portion. Right. So when you start talking numbers, like you know, you're talking 700 other cases and 120, whatever it is, half of those being Taiwan. That's a big number. Okay, so I imagine it's much. In some ways, it's harder, and in some ways, it's easier for the Taiwan government to to deal with this. So how is Taiwan dealing with it? Um, better than they were. Uh, you know, the, the, the court still will sentence a person to a year in jail for espionage. Um, it's not a very, very serious crime in, in Taiwan. Uh, however, you know, I, I'm a little older, so I can remember going through many years where Taiwan prosecuted no one. Nobody for espionage. We went five, six, seven, eight, nine years and no one was prosecuted, you know, in Taiwan for espionage. So it's just in the last five years or so, five, six, seven years that they've started prosecuting again and bringing people to, you know, and taking it as a serious problem. Right. But that's still tactical, like the, what the U.S. is doing. Is it, it is. It is. Is, um, is Taiwan being strategic about it? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And I can't tell you, I can give you an honest answer that I know. Um, they are more aware of strategy and more, and I, and I think more inclined to apply it in a strategic response. Uh, but they have problems within their own ranks, right? There, there's no real decision on what the relationship with China should be. So that, that, that's a problem that affects them at their core. But as strategy goes, I'll tell you, they're very, they've told us a few times, you've got to understand China's strategy on this. They're very, very good about that. They really understand that. 